Hey, have you ever dreamed of embodying a character whose blade and wit is honed to a razor's edge? Does your adventurous lifestyle and innate charisma allow you to secure several types of booty? Well, congratulations! You might be a swashbuckler. But what is a swashbuckler? Well, shave down your mustache, work on your rambunctious tete-a-tete, and get ready for multiple rounds of wind sprints, cause we're gonna make a scene. So what makes a hero heroic? For some, it's the devotion to a cause at the detriment to one's own health or happiness. For others, it's the idea of standing up for what's right even in the face of extreme prejudice. And for a few, it's just the moxie to follow your own ideals no matter the circumstances. That's got to be the best part I've ever seen. So it would seem. Here we find the swashbuckler, the wily debonair swordsman with a tongue as quick as his blade, who is as dangerous to his enemies as he is charming to his allies. The swashbuckler is a character archetype beloved by generations of people, from Zorro to the Pirates of the Caribbean and even the Princess Bride. So naturally, you'd think that translating this idea into a game focused on adventure and storytelling would be a dream come true. And you'd be right! In many ways, the swashbuckler is really a breath of fresh air for the rogue class in general, but we'll get to that. For now, imagine you're a vigilante with a heart of gold or a reformed criminal trying to outrun his past, or a cat with really nice boots. Just know that there's a very high probability you're going to be played by Antonio Banderas. But first... Do you consider the laws of physics more of a suggestion? Do you see time less as a constant fourth dimensional force and more like a space highway? Well, if so, you need Chronomancer's Guide to the Future Part 2 for the most precise timeline navigation. The long-awaited sequel to the Chronomancer's Guide to the Future allows you to patrol the timeline like an interstellar state trooper, correcting past mistakes and occasionally handing out speeding tickets. You see, history has a bad habit of trying to undo itself, and it's up to you and your team to put it back together. Chronomancers is compatible with any game and setting, and has created custom time travel rules, mechanics, tools, and tables for both DMs and players, giving you everything you need to set the timeline straight. Build the perfect party with unique roles and abilities, and help the goddess of time, the mysterious seamstress, reweave the multiverse. You can pick up part 1 right now, but the Kickstarter for part 2 will be live very soon. Or also right now if you're a Chronomancer, but for us regular folks, just go to this link below and click the Notify Me on Launch button to be the first to join the Time War. And a big thanks to the folks behind Chronomancers for sponsoring the show. Now, back to the video. So it's your dream to be a swashbuckler. Well, first you need to figure out what kind. Are you as edgy and borderline psychotic as Blackbeard, or as jovial and upbeat as Robin Hood? Either way you slice it... <laughs> Get it? Because, anyway, you start out as a rogue. Rogues are good at stuff, and by default, gooder than you, so they get a lot of skills. You get four skills at level one from a big-ass list. I'm not going to spell them out for you. You can read. However, we also get expertise at this level, letting you double your proficiency bonus and two of those skills. And while I want you to be able to flavor up your character however you want, please make sure to take persuasion. It's going to come in really handy later. In general, we're going to focus on your decks and riz stats to really play into that swashbuckler archetype, and this is going to skyrocket your persuasion score to basically supernatural levels. You also get sneak attack for 1d6 extra damage if you meet the sneak attack criteria. And this goes up by an extra d6 every two levels you take in Rogue. Your goal is to take advantage of an opponent's opening to deliver one very deliberate attack. Luckily for you, your charm is enough to confuse or piss off the bad guys to get in that deadly slice. I mean, really nothing to me says swashbuckler more than just straight up flirting mid-fight. Who says every encounter needs to end in death? Some can end in, well, not death. Nope. We also get Thieves Can't. Thieves Can't what? Thieves Can't Stop Complaining That I Compared This To The Language In Spongebob Last Time. Fine, you want the boring explanation? It's a series of random words and phrases from many languages, but still for some stupid reason every Thieves Guild uses the same one. So more or less, just replace every third word with fart and every fifth word with butt and that's Thieves Can't. You mother fartin' dumb butts. At second level, we get Cunning Action, which allows you to dash, disengage, or hide as a bonus action because while you might be a hero, you will still often find yourself on the wrong side of the law or outrunning an angry father or two. But finally, all our time spent on swordplay and trash talking has paid off. Because at third level, we become a real swashbuckler. At last, we can stop all this slinking in the shadows nonsense and prove to everyone who the real star of the show is. Your fighting style would consist of popping in and out of danger and carefully selecting targets, but that 
makes you all the more dangerous one-on-one. -on -one. Fancy footwork plays into this beautifully, letting you lash out at an opponent and dip away without them getting an opportunity attack. This saves your bonus action to kite them over to a new location or hop back and forth, staying out of their reach. You also get Rakish Audacity, which not only lets you add your Riz modifier to your initiative rolls, but also gives you a new way to land a sneak attack. If you have an opponent locked into a duel and have no other allies or enemies within 5 feet, you now have sneak attack every turn as long as you don't have disadvantage. You are an absolute menace to fight one on one, and once you combine this with fancy footwork, you can drop in on a target, sneak attack them, dash away, and repeat this until tender. Be creative with it too. With all your cunning action abilities, you are the Swiss army knife of being annoying to pin down. Just try not to be swarmed by enemies. Crowds aren't the best for you. Who knew? Your biggest weakness would be multiple swords. You also get steady aim for free advantage and sneak attack as long as you don't move or do anything else, but unless you plan on dual wielding a sword and a hand crossbow, this ability isn't something you're going to use that often. Fifth level gets us uncanny dodge to shrug off damage by burning your reaction just in case your opponent gets in a lucky shot, but sixth level gets us expertise and two more skills. If you didn't take persuasion, now's the time because nothing says rogue and swashbuckler like getting yourself into trouble and then fight talking your way out of it. Ayo. Fight like my sister! I fought your sister, that's a compliment! Seventh level gets us evasion, letting you take half damage on failed deck saves and no damage on successful ones. Meaning you can just cartwheel out of a dragon's fire breath and then stab them in the toe. You'd be surprised how often that works. But at ninth level, we get panache. <laughs> now here's where things get real good. By this point, you've become so charming or so distracting that even the bad guys can't ignore your flair, letting you use your action to force them to make an inside check against your persuasion check or take a fat debuff. I mean, come on, that's not even fair. Even if you only have a measly plus one in charisma, your bonus to this check is a plus nine and just going up. When they fail, not if, when they fail, the enemy has disadvantage against any other target and can't make an opportunity attack unless it's against the swashbuckler for a minute. Combine this with fancy footwork and you've completely eliminated opportunity attacks for that enemy. But wait, there's more? Yeah, if you can believe it, you can also do this check to non-hostile creatures to just straight up charm them for a minute instead. So you can infiltrate hostile businesses by flirting with the front desk girl or make sure you always get the best seats at the local tavern. You basically have a better and more consistent version of charm person and with your high charisma, that's just dangerous. 11th level gets you reliable talent, making sure you never roll below a 10 on an ability check you are proficient with, which is just a stupid ability for a skill monster especially for us. Meaning the lowest we can roll on a persuasion check is a 19 if we only have that plus one charisma. Your DM better have rolled up some insightful motherfuckers cause your panache ability is gonna steamroll through any situation you need to talk your way out of. At 13th level we get elegant maneuver to spend a bonus action to gain advantage on an acrobatics or athletics check you make during that turn. More ways to use your bonus action are always super cool but I'm just imagining all the cliffs you can shove your enemies off of. 14th level gets us blind sense to hear any invisible creature within 10 feet of you, somehow. And 15th level gets us slippery mind for proficiency in wisdom saves. But at 17th level we become a master duelist. Once per day if we fail to hit a creature with an attack roll we can just do it again but with advantage. Not only does this give us sneak attack if we didn't already have it, it allows you to make sure you get that fancy footwork in a time you need it most, or deliver that huge 96 sneak attack to finish off the big bad target. Finally, at 18th level you get elusive, guaranteeing no attack roll ever has advantage on you, and 20th level gets a stroke of luck to turn a miss into a hit or treat a failed ability check into a flat 20 once per day. As far as capstones go, they're not the worst I've seen, but it's level 20 guys, can we spice it up? Make it to where every single stroke gets sneak attack or something rad, man. We stuck with Rogue for 20 levels, you gotta help me out here. But anyway, does the swashbuckler live up to its dramatic reputation? I certainly think so. Panache is so great of an ability that I could almost make an entire video just on the hundreds of uses it has by itself. But like the best subclasses we've seen, the swashbuckler sticks to a theme and does it really, really well, while building upon itself with each new subclass ability. 
While personally I think the weakest rogue abilities actually come in the later levels, the swashbuckler gets most of what they need right out the gate, which is much appreciated. The entire concept of the swashbuckler is such a relief too. While most of the rogue subclasses focus on the dark underbellies of the D&D world, the swashbuckler forces you to play right out in the open to take advantage of all its abilities. In fact, I think the swashbuckler is the departure from convention that the rogue class needed. I mean, how many of them actually attempt to hog the spotlight instead of run away from it? And I can't miss talking about multiclassing either. We haven't made it to the swords bard yet, but what an absolute match made in heaven those two are. But fighter, blade singer, hexblade, hell even lore bard to really hammer home the insult game, the options are incredible, especially when focusing those combos that highlight the run and gun playstyle and put this subclass in a league of its own. So if you aren't at your best, unless you're the absolute center of attention, can flirt so effectively it basically counts as magic, and have ever forced someone to chase you so long they'd rather just be stabbed, guess what? You might be a swashbuckler. Hey guys, big thanks for making it this far and watching the video. If you like this one, make sure to share it, especially if you know somebody who's playing this subclass. More subs are coming up on the poll very soon, so check that out, and until next time, have a good one, and I'll see you soon. Welcome to the game, episode 42 of the game, and we happen to be live tonight here in the U.S. It's Labor Day. Is it the same in New Zealand? Do you guys do Labor Day? No. no? We, we, we do have a Labor Day, but it's an entirely different date, I believe. Um, don't ask me what it is, because I have no fucking idea. Oh, I was just curious. <laughs> but we, but... we do have a Labor Day. Okay. But it's not the same. Yeah. Not the we same also day. have the Queen. Well, I was going to say the Queen's birthday. We have that, but now it's the King's birthday. Oh, really? Which, oddly enough, is not actually the King's birthday, but it's a date that we celebrate the King's birthday. So, you know, Commonwealth. I see. Interesting. All the things you learned when we're just uneducated U.S. folks that don't know anything about geography, like me. Well, uh, <laughs> you know lots of stuff about world building and other I, things. I do. You know, fake worlds. I'm great with fake worlds. Real world. Right. <laughs> anyway, oh, no. folks. Yeah. What, in this what we're episode, here to talk about. Yes. In this episode, we're going to be exploring how to incorporate holidays and festivals because they sometimes go hand in hand, but sometimes they don't. Uh, mm -hmm. And how to incorporate them into your tabletop games. Uh, so I hope you guys join us. I know probably you all are having barbecues and, you know, having a grand old time. But uh, we're here because we want to entertain you. All right. <laughs> Moving on. Are you because not entertained? Yeah, exactly. Please give us the likes. Show us that you are entertained and invite your friends over. You know, if if your barbecue is a little boring or you just need a little something in your ear while, you know, your Aunt Sue is talking to you and you're like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Like we might be a little more, more entertaining. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, right. Okay. So, if you folks. Get, get three new viewers on the channel today. We can get Amber to dance on, on the table nope. for you. <laughs> <laughs> not real not true, not true. <laughs> i am the worst dancer by the way real quick Fine. little I, story i volunteer instead i'll do it i think you would be much better at it i mean you definitely have more of an entertainment background i think than i do <laughs> but <laughs> i uh i i know we don't have time for this folks i'll make it quick uh when i was little my parents gave me the choice of do piano or do ballet um i had already been taking years of piano i liked it but i wanted to do something else so i said i'm gonna give up piano i'm gonna do ballet i was i mean not to pick on like 
there was a girl who was larger than I was. Okay. I don't like to pick on people because of their weight, but she was not very good in the class and I was worse than her. <laughs> like I was the worst in the class. Okay. Man. It was just, and so after a year of that, I was like, yeah, no, I'll do piano. I'm, I'm great. Uh, so not coordinated, not a good dancer. Nope. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and Avery, you know, uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe, did your Aunt Sue dance? <laughs> maybe your Aunt Sue was in my my class, and I hope she wasn't the other person that I was just talking about. Anyway, moving on. Uh, oh, Russell, he, okay, guys, this is why we were late. I was just about to say, I'm really sorry that we're late. We were having some issues trying to get camera and sound set up. Here he is. And... <sighs> Our regulars will know last episode, Russell didn't drop at all. And that's because we did something different. And we tried yeah. to do that same different thing today. And for some reason, it wouldn't work for us. So we had to resort to the old method. And the old method is that we just have Russell drop every every once in a while. So yeah. everybody start taking bets on how long he'll be on the stream before he drops again. Right. <laughs> and then we'll really try to figure this out. We don't understand. Like, same settings as last week and everything. And for yeah. some reason, it just wasn't working. Uh, okay. So, yeah, Avery, your Aunt Sue grew up in New Zealand. Then your Aunt Sue is definitely safe from me because I have yet to go to New Zealand. Not that I don't want to. I definitely would love to. It sounds beautiful. Middle Not Zealand. my Aunt Sue. <laughs> what did I, like did I say the wrong it. thing? No, I said we like to call it Middle Zealand. Middle Zealand. <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys, we have a lot to cover and we're a little late. So I'm really, really sorry. So holidays and go <laughs> okay i just had like that deer in headlights like what are we talking about okay holidays yes holidays, holidays and festivals holidays and festivals right okay so as i mentioned festival there's there's not always a festival when there's a holiday and there's not always a holiday when there's a festival sometimes they're tied closely together sometimes you have both but sometimes you don't. Uh, so if you're going to put in a holiday into your game, this is something, let me ask you, because you're a little bit more versed in all the D&D lore. Is there a book or is there actual D&D lore on holidays that I'm not aware of? I, I don't know about books. Maybe there is. I mean, in fact, to be fair, there used to be a, box set, a boxed set for the Forgotten Realms um, a long time ago. Um, for second edition, which I had, and that did include some com uh, some holidays and festivals in it, kind of randomly in various places. But um, as for an actual book, I think you would have to go onto the DM's Guild website or you okay. know something like that to something find that something that someone else created, maybe. Yeah. 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 So. I mean yeah, that's why I think this is a good topic for those folks who are homebrewers or those folks who, you know, you're running a module and you're like, yeah, I want to put a festival in here to have some, you know, quote unquote downtime or not even downtime, but because we had that episode about downtime, but something fun, something low stress, maybe, which now that I'm thinking about this, you could also make a festival very high stress and throw in a monster. But um yeah. Yeah, so let's let's talk about holidays and how you can right. think about holidays and how to add them into your game, right? Well, ha have you have you used holidays at all in any of your games so far? So Is here's the thing. Done? I I haven't actually put in real holidays in the sense that like I haven't created a calendar for my world, so I haven't created right. holidays that are tied to certain dates. Right. However, I have st like when I know that my players are ready for a session that's a little bit more, like I said, we play it like it's fun, uh, right. then I will get them to an area where there's like a town nearby or something that is having some sort of festival for some sort of holiday, like that I will make up right. on the spot. But it's right. not because they happen to be like they were trying to get there on the date that, you know, like it just, right. it right. just happened. So, okay. What about you? Yeah, I feel oh, like well, you've I've... probably got a calendar built for your world. <laughs> well, funnily enough, I just put a calendar for my world in the Trello for you to have a look at. If oh, you, did you? If you want to. <laughs> yeah, um, I do have a calendar for the world. And basically, I mean, as far as festivals go, I've had a couple of games with festivals, ones with, for example, the Festival of the Wheel and Hemoth Terrace, um, where the high elves take out their great big um, 
coin, the, the Anum Strike coin, this huge table-sized coin that was once a giant coin, and mm -hmm. they parade it around the city as part of the Festival of the Wheel every year to demonstrate their wealth, um, for example. And the Festival of the Wheel has is, is got a lot more to it than that, but um, I draw a lot from pagan festivals, um, of which there were many and are still many that continue, you know, Beltane and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, all that stuff's really useful. Um, and I played in a D&D game recently on my channel where Caitlin Abigail Louise Flower was the dungeon master um, called the Festival of Fayum, um, where I played Thomas Hardley, the, the oh, that's halfling, right. um, which was also set in a festival. So a couple of festivals recently. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So usually what I end up doing for my games is whenever we're close to a holiday in our real lives, then I will toss in like that session is our Christmas right. session. That session is right. our, uh, you know, we played a really spooky kind of like haunted mansion area right. uh, around ha Halloween, but uh, it wasn't like we stopped the main campaign and did that. I planned ahead and kind of led them so that on the game for that day, than right. it happened to be. So it still fit in with the main campaign. But but uh, let's talk about, okay, so if you- I, it, Sorry, it did just occur to me. Um, have you, If you've ever played the massive multiplayer role-playing game online, Neverwinter, not Neverwinter Nights, that's a different game, but yes. just Neverwinter, the role-playing game online. I have um, not. They, they, but like World of Warcraft does this too, they have festivals on, on a kind of regular basis. Um, mostly it's an opportunity for them to charge you for microtransactions mm. um, to buy <laughs> stuff. But, um, you know, and they use it for marketing and that sort of thing. But they usually put out like a themed dungeon or a themed quest or a quest line or something like that. And you pick up some sort of token for something rather. And they're all connected to the various gods of uh, Faron mm -hmm. um, in D&D. So, you know, that's the, 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 that is one place you can pick up some ideas for festivals is from video games. That um, is true. D and D ones in particular have a lot of that stuff in them. Yeah, lots of role playing video games. Um, yeah. So yeah, if we if you wanted to if if you weren't just trying to do a last minute like hey we're having a Christmas session or a, or a Halloween session because those are the holidays coming up Labor Day session you know that would be tonight. Um, take a look at the different holidays that cultures explore um, because there's some holidays right. that are just for cult different cultures, uh, like Dia de los Muertos. Uh, I right. mean, that's not that's not necessarily observed all over the world, but if you come from that culture, that is something that you would most likely observe no matter where you are in the world, right? right. So right. maybe even, even as players, I think players could think about this uh, because if you build it into your backstory that, you know, this, let's say you play a tabaxi and in tabaxi culture, you know, you have some kind of a holiday around, I don't know, uh, wool gathering and string making. I don't know. That sounds fun. Right. Uh, you know, and it happens to fall on such and such day and you're not home for that holiday. But you guys have downtime. You're in an, a weird city. You want to feel like home. So you go find some sheep and I don't know, right. make some wool string so here, here's a question a, a thought on this idea too because like holidays right we as as modern people in the industrialized civilized world that we live in we have these holidays which we kind of in american terms you kind of classify them as usually vacation time if you like yeah um, where you get time off work well D D is a usually it's a sort of medieval high fantasy setting um, and if you have looked at history, it's not only until sort of recently that, uh, you know, working hours have been cut back to just five day weeks and that mm -hmm. children don't have to work 18 hour days and shit like this. Um, maybe I'm exaggerating slightly, but not <laughs> much. Not much. Um, so as you know, depending on your setting, you may or may not actually get a holiday. You might there might be a festival, um, you know, but that being said, certainly there were a lot more festivals in historical times and, you know, people lived for that stuff. They didn't have TV. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have role-playing games. So they lived for their festivals and their festivals were a huge part of their lives. So, yeah. you know, they, and I think the reality is that they did get time off for those festivals, but um, it would very much come down to the local landowner or Lord. Right. Um, Whoever's in charge. Know, whoever's in charge. So it's not like you, you get a, a, sort of 
holiday in the traditional modern sense of the term but you know so i'm kind of wondering how do people feel about that what do they think how do they what how does that work in their worlds yeah so yeah you yeah, know, and sorry, that's the thing is, no, I was just thinking about that because I mean, in the, in medieval times, right, everything probably mm. wasn't all hunky dory, and you could just take time off. But right. as adventurers, you're not necessarily part of that dyna- that right. city's dynamic, you know. Right. Uh, right. But even yeah, even so, uh, I'm just, I've been trying, I lost my train of thought. I <laughs> we were talking about festivals and uh, the, the, holidays. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> So we were talking about holidays uh, with cultural context, and uh, there's also holidays that are like um, tied to religion, tied to uh, even history or myth. Not really history, mythology. Legends. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, think of most of them would be. Yeah, Easter. With Easter, we're celebrating. You know that Jesus rose from the dead, uh, but it could be, you know. some rebirth. other yeah or rebirth um uh what is it chinese new festival, year festi- yeah chinese new year i have the festival of the phoenix which is very much the same sort of thing as a sort of rebirth festival you know yeah, um, yeah. And, and you, i mean japan has some pretty interesting festivals they've got like whole freaking penis festivals and stuff like this too and they <laughs> like i'm not even kidding that's no and, i've and seen it that's why I'm laughing. Right. I mean, it's and it's normal in, in their culture. So, you know, it's right. I mean, to be fair, it's, it's a normal human condition thing. It's only us that think it's weird. See, that's the thing with culture. I think there's such a big thing that you can look at with culture because, like you said, in Japan, that's just a completely normal thing to them. But for some reason, like in the U.S., we see that and we're like, "Whoa, that's so oh crazy God. and wild!" And yeah, but right. so another thing to kind of think about in world build is like, you know, ev- you could throw in a really crazy holiday, and everyone in the city just thinks that it's completely normal. But you adventurers right. are going to come in going, "What? <laughs> right. What's happening I mean, here?" Uh- Let's say you happen to be exploring in the outback of the Angomaak Orkan Empire. What kind of festivals do the orcs have? Yeah. You know, I mean, they could be quite brutal festivals. They could be, you know, they could look festivals. like a, like a lot of violence is happening mm. and it's it's yeah. intended violence and it's it's yeah. completely accepted. Right. Um, it's part of life. The te- testings and things like where you have to go through an initiation, the newbies come along, you know, the when you get to the age of twelve, they send you out into the desert to to bring back a live giant scorpion or something. I don't know. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Rites of passage. Rites yeah, of that's passage. great. And that's kind of um, a bit of a festival tied to that at certain dates. What, yeah. uh, hey Russ, what about that one where kids swallow frogs you threw at us? <laughs> I forgot about that. I need to hear about this. <laughs> uh, so the characters went to this place called Kivantan, which is a, a smaller city in the Muldrayan Protectorate in Sidariel. And when they got there, they were trying to find uh, somewhere where they, they were basically looking for information. And they started interviewing children on the street, you know, asking kids on the street if they, what they knew and where they could find people. And they're like, have you seen anyone do anything strange lately? I think was the question that they raised with me. And this, this boy was like, uh, I saw Peter swallow a frog last week, you know. <laughs> So that's kind of ended up becoming a thing where during this particular festival, um, you know, kids have to swallow frogs or toads or something like that. Oh, wow. Um, that's sort great. Of made up on the spot. The so. stuff that's made up on the spot is always the best, I think. Frequently, yes. Yeah. So, okay, back to holidays. Uh, think about holidays in a cultural context the the history or the origin whether it's real or not i always say this when it comes to history there's the true history and then there's what everyone believes happened because either for whatever reason that knowledge was lost no one was there at that time whatever so like we weren't there when jesus came back from the dead like that could just be passed down because of you know words in a book or it could have really happened and who knows but there's a holiday around it 
Yeah. Right. It could have been yeah. something else and somebody just interpreted it in a completely different way. And well, now I mean, we have look, a holiday around it. Taking that, that example, I mean, there's there's like before that culture arose, that they that oddly enough, there were dying and rising gods having civil celebrations and festivals on those exact dates yeah. for thousands of years, which also oddly align with certain planetary positions and and you know, risings and fallings and so on and so forth. So it's you know very Various cultures have celebrated oddly similar things on very similar dates for a very long time. Celestial events um, are a huge uh, holiday maker, <laughs> if you like. <laughs> okay, apparently we both have a lot in common in our DMing, uh, I guess based on our insights. So we'll see, yeah. Right. Um, also think about symbols and traditions. This is probably mm. my favorite part about building anything on the fly in a game is what does it look like to everyone because i'm all of a sudden i'm just yeah throw out colors throw out you know some random simple i mean christmas like who decided that it's red and green and gold and silver like or maybe that's right. gold and silver is mostly new year's i don't know but who decided right. that and then it right. they just went with it and now those are the colors that are so like nobody can wear red and green together when it's not Christmas, because guess what? People are going to see it and go, it's not Christmas time. You're, what are you doing? You're a leprechaun. Yeah. <laughs> so think there's about. There's also a lot of corporate appropriation of festivals in, in our world too. You know, Coca-Cola has pretty much owned Christmas for a yep. while. Yeah. Um, you know, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of lobbying to take control of the image that we have of many of these things. And so, yeah. Yeah, M and M's. I remember. I mean, yeah. Right. Anyway, uh, let's see. Yeah, so Christmas has various um, symbols: the tree, Santa, stockings, ornaments. But there's also like objects and rituals that are associated, like gift giving. Just right. having an image of gifts. You already under like mm. get an image. Mm. It's either a birthday or it's Christmas. Um, right. We've got colors. So oh, clothing. There's always some kind yeah. of clothing usually so associated costumes, with holidays. clothing. Yeah. You know, things like that. Um, I mean, for example, like Easter, for example, um, in the pagan traditions, there's always a lot of making of eggs, you know, painting yes. eggs and that type of stuff is a thing. And there's rituals and things associated with these types of things. Let's not forget Mayflower, um, <clears throat> Maypole dancing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's so many aspects of building a holiday. It's not just like have your players walk into a town and go, it's Beltine. Like, what does Beltine right. look like in your right. and, world? And what do you eat for dinner on Beltane? Right. You know? Yeah. The what, associated what's the traditional food. meal. Right. Um, I mean, you guys have Independence Day over there and you mm -hmm. have uh, what's the other one? Uh, uh, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Right? Yeah. We, we don't have you guys don't have that. Okay. <laughs> No, because we, we, we don't give any thanks. We, we, we're quite privileged. <laughs> of course, like, I was going to say, I mean, it's associated with the U.S.'s history. But yeah. I have a really funny story. Okay, so my father came from the Philippines, right? Uh, so uh, he was born in the Philippines and then came over. I was born in the U.S. So I grew up thinking, you know, all my friends are having turkey on Thanksgiving, but we never have turkey. And it took me until... I was about 12, 13, 14, around that age when I finally asked my folks, like, why don't we have turkey on Thanksgiving? Everyone else is having turkey. And my dad said, we don't have turkey in the Philippines. I never ate it. So therefore, we're never going to eat it. Like, that's just, we don't do that. <laughs> and it wasn't until my adult life when I married my husband and started having Thanksgiving somewhere else that I finally started having turkey. <laughs> also, right. painting of eggs. Same thing. We didn't do painting of eggs, but it wasn't until right. my adult life that I started doing that. It's it's right. a very you, when you're not exposed to it because of culture, um, right. it can look really strange. <laughs> so there's there's food, there's like songs and dances that are associated. There's little uh, many little arty things that people do around these times, mm -hmm. and actual proper rituals and rites as well that occur. Um, yeah, you know, as we said, meals are a big thing and communal sort of spaces and times and color schemes aesthetics all of that stuff there's also yeah. you know you were talking about like rituals and rites and things but uh mm. if the holiday is associated with uh like a religion then 
for example, Christmas, there's usually people that tend to do a little bit more church going around that time than any right. other time. Uh, right. So you might see like a, a, an uptick in activity in temples around this time, you know. For sure. Yeah. I run a game um, called Greymore, which actually was a, a module uh, written by somebody else. Funnily enough, a Kiwi who now works for um, MCDM, Matthew Colville. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, which is pretty cool. Um, and it sort of centers around this little town in the middle of nowhere during a festival. Actually, I might have added that myself, I think, the festival thing. Um, the players go there to uncover a murder mystery, and I th there's a festival going on when the players get there. It's about to start, and they're all preparing the temple for it and so on. And um, as, the, as the time preparing for the ritual um, sort of builds up, so does the mystery and the drama. Um, so you can sort of really tie the festival into the plot in a way. You know, you see this in movies all the time, too. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, you'll also want to think about the, like, like I said, there's there's some holidays that are associated with specific days on calendars. Like new for New Year's in the U.S., it's like it's always the first day of the year, January 1st. But Thanksgiving is the fourth Thursday of the month. So that date can change at any right. at any time right and right. and then there's like hanukkah That's not very celestial right hanukkah <laughs> now i'm really sorry folks i don't know a lot about hanukkah but i know that the date is different every year i don't know who decides that date or how right. it's decided but then it also has like an eight day duration you know right. so there's there's holidays and that could last for i don't know right. a week over a week I'm right. Like, I mean, there is, and there are certain um, celebrations and, and uh, traditions and say, for example, Islam, where you might fast for a long period of time. Right. Um, you know, weeks or months um, in, in that sort of thing. So fasting, I guess, is another thing you can add to the list. Pilgrimages are yes. another thing. Pilgrimages you know, are on, big. On. Yeah. Yeah. And yep, then I've it's also, the oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I have this uh, tradition in Sidario, uh, which I haven't really gotten to implement in any games yet, but I'm looking forward to it, um, where the goblins go on a pilgrimage every year. They have to, um, or at least during their lifetime, they have to visit seven holy sites around the world. Um, just so the, the goblins? goblins? Just the goblins. It's a goblin pilgrimage. Interesting. And so these goblin pilgrims that wander around the world... Um, you know, and you could bump into them and so on. Anyway, that that's a sort of side note, but yeah, yeah. no, that that's great though. I yeah, that's a great way to build that kind of stuff in. And right. uh, you don't expect to see goblins as pilgrims. When you no, you don't. <laughs> that's why I was curious. I was like, just the goblins. Um, yeah. But you mentioned fasting, and consider right. if fasting were part of the holiday or part of the tradition of the holiday, how their your daily life would be different because you have to fast, you know, uh, I believe right. you were talking about, I don't know if it's the same uh, religion that you were talking about, but I, I had one in my notes where uh, when they fast, they fast from sunrise to sunset. So then right. they have a meal <laughs> before sunrise and they have a meal after sunset. Uh, right. Because if when I hear fasting, my brain just goes, oh, you're just not eating, period. But how long right. is that sustainable? Right. right. So you have to change right. your your uh, right. daily life to yeah. accommodate yeah. Um, and different different uh, festivals might have different types of fasting so i mean you can have full day 48 hour famine fasting yep. you know where you're only allowed to eat lollies yeah yeah or like <laughs> i'm only allowed to drink uh just liquids you know that kind of yeah. thing yeah or you're only allowed to drink beer because it's a beer festival oh yeah oh fast <laughs> yes <laughs> um so and then think about Whatever this, fe not, well, not just festivals, but I'm thinking strictly holidays right now. Whatever this holiday mm -hmm. is, it, it, is the city, is the town, is the area, are they spending like months preparing for it or a month? Are they, are right. the decorations already out? Like, just like right. Christmas, like people put decorations out like at least a month in advance, if not more. Right. And you get to right. see them that, that whole time, but you're not right. necessarily observing the holiday. Right. Yeah. There's a build up. So, you know, yeah. what does that look like in your world? And and, and what are the players? Seeing? Refuse, you got people who refuse to take their decorations down for months afterwards. <laughs> yes. Or, you know, like uh, I'm not going to say anybody in particular, but, you know, left it up for like a month or two because 
it's lazy, you know, because, yeah, you're lazy. You, you just want, <laughs> and, and also a little bit of nostalgia there as well. This I is wanted true. to add it into this also, like take the Romans as a great example. I mean, not only did they have lots of holidays and festivals, but things like, um, you know, give them games and give them bread. You know, they, they had a lot of gladiatorial games, a lot of, uh, races you know chariot races that type of stuff and they would give they would give you know hundreds of days off the calendar for these mm -hmm. things that they would literally pay everybody to go to these games and what have you um so they didn't have to they didn't have to work during this period and it made the pot the emperors very popular indeed you know so celebrating things like that um things that the the ruling class can gift to the to the common folk yes um, to, to seem one... benevolent or right. yeah right. or for we're whatever reason the war. we're having a war we're going to send off all your men folk to 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 gaul to die um but that's okay because we're having 40 days of fucking yeah. watching them you know killing lions and and gladiators for yeah whatever, you know <laughs> yeah. yeah so that's well, that's a good point and, and also because um, I was looking up, you know, I mean, imagine if the holiday didn't exist yet, but for some reason the holiday was created because your players arrived, like being becoming a part of the origin story of a holiday That's because great. your players um, celebrate the players killed the dragon. And so now right. it, it's it's dragon free day and we ha we'll right. celebrate this every year. And what did it what is Saint Murder Hobo Day? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so i mean that actually that's a great i think i'm gonna have to do that in my next campaign is let my players somehow build a holiday un yeah, like un unknowingly they will be I'm part of a holiday well. right yeah. i think that's fun yeah. that's so great. all right folks i know it seems like we just started but we should probably take a break because we're gonna have to end at a very particular time and i want to make sure that you guys get to see who we have in store for you for our break uh yeah. okay I'm going to I'm going to do a little build up here because Ooh. I was very remember do you remember how excited I was when we had yeah. Wind Rose on because right. dwarf metal just just calling it like just to call it dwarf metal is ingenious, right? Yeah. But <laughs> tonight we have pirate metal. They're oh apparently God. known for being no. pirate metal and as soon as I saw that I went Oh my gosh! And it's super cool. I think at this point, like anything that sounds like D&D &D metal is just yeah. awesome. They're going to have to work very hard indeed because I fucking hate pirates. So just to let no, it be known. Oh, really? So they, they better be fucking good then. I, I'm going to be very skeptical about this, Amber. We'll so have to I'll wait until after the break to get your you uh, opinion. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, pirate, so yeah. we have a Sounds like they stole the fucking the, the music. I mean, it's what? Like pirate movies. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, no, no. I know they didn't because I listened to it. It's very awesome. So you guys are going to get a little treat of pirate metal, okay, from Ailstorm. We have our music parody by Arcane Anthem. We have our deception checks. And, you know, I think I said this last time. I don't remember if there was bad lip reading, but there seems to be, has been. Anyway. Enjoy the break because pirate right. metal. <laughs> and, and, and then, quick shout out to Joanna Grotenhaus. She plays Dala Talandaran on the Van Gate Chronicles. Oh, nice! So, yeah, thanks for hanging out. Yay! Hey, Joanna. Okay, how can so you hate like this. This is how you hate pirates. You just hate them. Right, army matey. <laughs> okay, folks. So we're gonna do the break. You guys are gonna listen to pirate metal and all the other fun stuff that we have during the break. We're gonna come back, and Russell's gonna tell us how much he loved or hated the video, and then yeah. we're gonna continue talking about holidays and festivals. All right, folks, stick around He's because get one chance. <laughs> one chance. Okay, it's on you, Alestorm, to wow us. All right, everybody. Yeah. We'll see you right after the break. See you soon.
Oop. Hey there, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. What can we do for you? Hey, I'm Vic, uh, Vic Mascatoni, and uh, my crew and I, we got us a heist up there at Old Aldor's place in a couple of nights. Now, uh, All right. we're trying to slay the dragon on this one, if you know what I mean. Uh, so, what I need is a, a few high-quality lockpicks, you know. None of that uh, cheap crap that you sell the commoners. Uh, so, what's a rogue got to do to get a good lockpick? What do you got for me? Uh, well, we don't sell parts, but if you're needing help getting into something, we can send a technician out. Ooh, that's even better. So, I tell you what. You send them up to Aldor's, right? You bring the lockpicks, right? We'll cut you guys in on the heist. Do it 50-50. Uh, Alright, um, is this heist in a car, a house, whatever uh, It's up at Old Outdoor's of. place. He's, he's sitting on a, on, a, on a mountain of gold up there, and we just need to get in there and fill up our bags with as much of that gold as we can, you know what I mean? But, uh, you bring your lockpicks, you show up, we'll split it, 60-40. I'm not sure our insurance would cover us sending our technicians. I tell you what, I'll slide you 2500 up front. Nobody's got to know nothing, you come with the picks. Well, I'm not the technician. I'm just the dispatcher. Well, get me to the technician. He might might want to make twenty five hundred. Um. Okay. What's the address? And that's gonna be up at Way. Okay. In which city? Uh, what are we calling here? We're calling Portland, right? Yeah, it's gonna be in Portland. Yeah. You said Way. That's correct. It's exactly how it sounds, ma'am. Yeah. All right. Is there a business nearby? I'm not able to pull that address up. Uh, well, you wouldn't be able to pull it up because it's uh, old Aldor's place. And uh, he keeps it under tight lock and key. Why, we need the picks. Uh, I don't think we'd be able to assist. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll go on down there to the next locksmith and see if they want to make some money. You have a good night, huh? You too. Why are you always making me climb in the smallest of places? Well, Jerry, this is the best way to get to the podcast that we need to steal this week. It's always through like the we do things. every week on Mondays. Mondays, every Monday. Yeah, religiously. I just, sometimes I wish we could just walk through the door, but yeah. Every Monday on where? Where do they find it? On so, yeah, Jeremy, on Spotify, Apple, any, anywhere yeah. you can find podcasts. That's Sorry, where we they, are. I get so hot in these vents. I think they have the heater on. Oh, Jeremy, don't move. Oh. Oh, wait. Yeah. Oh, just, oh, oh, just, oh. <laughs> Michael and Jeremy steal your podcast every Monday, wherever you get your podcasts and stuff. We're going to take your podcast and we're going to do it better, faster, stronger, hornier. Yes. In an hour or more. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs>
we won this fight of our greedy rogue looting all in sight. Oh, and now we have cursed armor, the rogue never knows better. Our bard is dry, cast in a dismal magic, barbarian. Just fill the strange check, our paladin says she won't lift a finger. The rogue was panicked and Could you make me nachos? You're in a bad mood. Well, I got cramps. Menstrual cramps? That's why ovaries are dumb. I'm gonna freestyle for you, okay? Okay. You ready? Mm-hmm. Girl, you know I don't like tuna, so I asked you wanna dance your wooden leg. It makes my heart just wanna break like Huba stank. Say, ooh, child, go in, go in, go in, go in, go in. Take you to the doctor, don't want to hold your wooden leg. I'm usually better oh, than that. Okay. I mean, it's just because. What? No, no, you no, freestyled no, about no, my no, fake no, no. leg? Oh. Your foot's kind of messed up, but I was hoping to talk about my tuna. But does my wooden leg gross you out? Yeah, some parts. It's like when I touch it. I get so sick. You get sick? Mm hmm. Uh, I can smell it. What? What? <laughs> Kiss me. I can't. I have a big wedgie. I made no friends buying a spork. Seriously, I want to get on my happy shoes. Where's the pig? Ate it. And my feathered duck? I ate it. R Ruffles and Mr. Peaches? Look, I'm sorry, I just... I like juicy pork. Oh, you're a gross skank. Eat that waffle bug. I'd like to slap you, boo. Why? I hate your food. <laughs> I was going to say, and we're back, but I had myself on mute for a second. <laughs> anyway, guys, I caught it. Okay, I think it, it's just a little bit of an off day for us, and I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll be real. <laughs> we're going to have an on day soon. We had an on day last week, and I thought from then on, all we would have was on days, but uh, yeah. technology. But Okay, so the pirates, they, they were they were pretty good, really, for, right? you know, all, all things considered. Actually, speaking of pirates, I recently watched a TV series from some New Zealanders uh, called Our Flag Means Death. Um, and if you haven't seen it, it is about pirates, and it's fucking hilarious. It's it's Reese Darby from uh, the, 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 uh, the, the Flight of the Concords, if you've heard of them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's hilarious. Uh, our flag means death. Definitely watch it. Series one, fantastic, hilarious. What? Okay, our flag. What is it? Uh, our flag means death. Means oh, it's death. also I'm writing it down. Okay. Cliff Curtis is in it too. He's another very famous Kiwi actor whom I met um, at least once. Awesome. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, Russell's opinion on the video. Thumbs up. All right. Yeah. Yep. I <laughs> and... want to be a pirate now. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, and then I wanted to, I, I didn't get a chance before the break to read Johanna's comment on uh, on our stream. So I, I read it, uh, being lazy about things like Christmas lights can be an indicator of the culture of a neighborhood too, in a gated community or military, uh, that would not fly. Whereas, you know, maybe other neighborhoods that would, which is very true. And that is another thing to consider if you're going to build out holidays in your world is... You know, if you're, let's say your players are heading to a fort, 
where it's mostly you know military folks then right. maybe yeah those those decorations are down the next day or you know whatever it is the right. feast is completely cleaned up the, everybody's very working minimal. yeah very minimal so good yeah. good and thing to economy, think about economy also has something to do with it um you know there's a lot of money floating around spare spare money floating around bigger festivals you know and, and if the you might have a situation where, for example, the Lord is extracting large amounts of tax all year, crushing crushing the, the small people the whole year round. And then, oh, let's have a lavish festival for three days. You know, and all the festival's over. It might be the only time you see that money. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so now I, I just read this other comment. Uh, Upright Man, Steampunk November? Question mark? Mm. What's Steampunk November? Please elaborate. Uh, <laughs> and now I well, feel like I'm going to have to share on Dungeon Studios page uh, one of the first Halloween costumes that I had worn as an adult. Uh, we have a big Halloween party. Uh, I'm not going to spend all our time on the show talking about it, but long story short, we're very competitive. And uh, when we had a pirate-themed Halloween party, me and my husband had to be different. So we were steampunk pirates, sky pirates, mm -hmm. and everybody else was traditional pirates. And I was very proud of that costume, so I'll have to share. Oh, um... I want to be a space pirate, though. Yeah, space pirate. Yeah. <laughs> you want to be like uh what is it? matt watney is that what's the movie um where he was saved on mars i i, I don't i don't know anyway uh, that rings a bell yeah that does ring a bell actually yeah there's yeah. this whole thing about the book where basically space law is like it's like international space so it's and then he colonized mars because he grew plants on it so therefore he's a space pirate right yeah by rules Fair enough. yeah right. by rules yeah. Being marooned on Mars. <laughs> All right. Folks, let's get back on topic. I feel like yes. we're just, it's, you know, maybe it's the holiday vibes. I don't know what it is. We're just having a hard time tonight. <laughs> but, uh, is, but, it a, but, is it a holiday where you are right now? It is. It's Labor Day. But, you know, nice. it's cool. with Labor Day, and, and maybe. Don't quote me, folks, because everybody celebrates this holiday, I think, differently. Lots of people have barbecues because you don't have right. to work today or anything like that. Right. But uh, with the the rotating shifts that happen in my household, like, it's just another day for us. <laughs> so, and, and my son still had band practice. So, even though he didn't have school today, he had band practice. Um, all right, folks. So, festivals and holidays. Um yeah. Where Okay, so I had said in the beginning that you can have holidays that have festivals. You can have holidays that don't have festivals, and you can have festivals that don't have holidays. So right. unless we've missed, I'm sure we have. There's tons of things to consider when it comes to holidays, and we, we have a little bit of a truncated show tonight. Um, right. I also want to talk about just the festival side of things. And what right. the festival looks like, not just building the holiday and the reason for the holidays and and the meaning behind the holiday right. and the origin behind it, but just the the actual celebration piece uh, right. of and the it holiday. Might be There's worth so much about it. a quick mention of how to run it as well, like how might you actually incorporate this into your game? Right, um, right. You know, uh, so. Which I have a really great example. I'm gonna I'm gonna share in just a minute when I get to it. Cool. Um, but yeah, so let's talk about the context of festivals, right? Uh, if it's not associated with a holiday, then it's most likely like you're celebrate you're celebrating for some reason. Whether maybe there's a wedding in the town that you're in, uh, a funeral or a funeral, and you know there's some folks there. We can call it a festival, whether it's like you know um, the funeral and people are mourning. But then there's the other side of it, which is the folks that do the wake and throw a big party because that's what they do that's i don't know part of their culture or that's what culture. the person wanted when they died right i'm just pulling up a resource here that yeah I have floating around um, because it just occurred to me weirdly enough that at the beginning of this module it starts with a funeral and a festival um, does it really chapter of this book and that's how the players meet they meet at a uh, funeral of one of their friends that they're all connected to. That's how the module introduces the players to each other and the beginning of the story. Yeah. So yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's just a great idea. That's a great way to start too, right? Start a campaign. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, we talked Sorry about start. <laughs> so uh, we were talking earlier about rites of passage, which mm. w could be tied to a holiday. 
but it could yeah. also not be. It could be more of a cultural aspect where, you know, uh, the young are now going to become adults. And so they got to go do a thing and it's part of the festival. Fire, fire right. walking or something, you know. <laughs> right. um, yeah. I have that in my world. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. If anybody uh, is watching the new series of Wheel of Time, uh, yes. the season one, season two just came out, by the way, folks. Watch yes. it if you're not. But season yes. one, they go into the tradition of like braiding the, the women's hair. It's a sign that they're now a woman. And so the young, they don't braid their hair. But once you're a woman, you braid your hair. So that becomes kind of a, a a rite of passage and then also they dunked her in the river but you know like um <laughs> that's nice isn't it yeah <laughs> lovely, lovely. So there's a lot really of dumb. ways that you can think about like uh, what in your city or your culture that you could celebrate or find a reason to to celebrate it and how would that look in your in your city or your culture Right. Um, what ceremonies are involved, what rituals. Um, right. And then again, kind of going along the same lines of holidays, what are there, are there any decorations involved? Are there, is there right. symbolism involved? Go ahead. I want to I say, like, I, th I think for me personally, when running a festival or a holiday thing like this, the most important thing for me personally is to create a schedule um, so that you can say on day one in the morning, they're going to do this day, mm -hmm. then a midday, afternoon, evening kind of schedule um, for each day of the holiday. So that as the story progresses, the festival builds to something and every scene has a new kind of component to it. So there mm -hmm. might be, you know, floats and things in one scene. And then in the next scene, there's bards and dancers. And the next scene, there's oral storytelling going on. And then there's an execution from the neighboring tribe. I don't know. I'm just making shit up now. But, <laughs> you know, so you have this kind of build up. And so having a schedule... And especially with any kind of social situation game, like I, I had a game, uh, uh, Dala was there, I'm going to say Dala, I mean to say Joanna was there, um, where we had a, a dinner scene. And it wasn't a festival exactly, actually, you know what, it might have been a festival. Actually, now that I think about it, I, yeah. I, I did a long time ago. But the reason for the dinner, I can't recall, but I'm wondering if it was actually a festival. It might have been like the midwinter festival. And so having all the NPCs and all of their cliques figured out um, and each one having some secrets and lies and things like that that they could share at any given time and knowing how those interactions were going to work, scheduling which player was going to talk to which NPC, um, really useful. Scheduling really, really works well for uh, DMing any kind of social thing like that. Right, right. It's so, very hard to play a lot of characters at the same time otherwise. Yeah, and that is that is something, you know, if we're going to talk about kind of the mechanics of running a festival, um, depending on what you do, because there's so much, and we haven't even finished talking about festivals, um, right. there's a lot happening that could kind of distract your players, and all of a sudden there's like five of them go in different directions, and how do you manage that, right. you know? Um, right. I typically will kind of, I don't want to spend too much time with one person. So I try yeah. to, if they do that, if all five of them go like this, then I really kind of truncate um, yeah. what they're doing in such a way that I'm spending 10 minutes with this person, 10 minutes with this person, 10 minutes, you know, and trying to find ways to get them back together or at least get them back into other smaller groups so that I can now spend time with this group and this group. And that's only two two things i have to oscillate between instead of five um <laughs> while so, you're talking i'm going to just reboot my camera here oh okay and i just thought you were thinking very hard and seriously about what i was saying <laughs> um yeah so okay people in the comments you guys are coming up with lots of other ideas and things that we did not mention like you know same holiday but celebrated differently across the world um Let's see. Uh, I was going to mention in uh, New Orleans, there's the, oh, what is it? Um, Mardi Gras. Uh, it, somebody did mention New Orleans, though, with funerals. And I didn't know this. They Funerals are often accompanied by second lines, uh, which are impromptu parades. I think that's kind of cool. I mean, I don't know. There's different views on death and, you know, how 
reverent or irreverent you are with it. Um, but yeah, those are those are really great ideas. Festival of the Wheel. I think uh, Russell might have mentioned that in the very beginning of the show. Uh, I think they're doing this. We happened across a pantomime de- depicting our heist. Okay, I'm going to read this out loud again so everyone who isn't in the chat can see this. I think during this festival, we happened across a pantomime depicting our heist. That sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, imagine seeing something like that. I did that in one of my games where uh, this is probably somewhere in like session 10, let's say. Uh, somewhere in the first first and second sessions, my players were actually part of a very huge event in a large city. Here we go. Okay, who took bets that Russell was going to drop before the end of the stream? <laughs> Everybody collect your money. <laughs> All right. Um, but uh, so they basically became the heroes of this one city within the very first and second session. And there were there was a very well-known bard there who happened to be traveling kind of along the same route as them, not necessarily with them. And by the time they got to the next major town, there were already bards kind of like they would pass by a tavern and start hearing a line or two and it would depict something that they did. And they're like, wait a minute, mm. what mm. are they singing about us? How are they singing about us already? And it's because news travels fast. Um, I've done this so, too. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun to do that for them. It's great. Um, um, quick shout out to, to Mike. Uh, I believe they gave us 500 stars. What? So, wow. Wow, thank That's, you so much, Mike. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah. Um, and, and, yeah, I've done festivals where uh, players, the Festival of the Wheel, in fact, where, where the players um, found there was a bunch of uh, uh, halfling bards doing a, a whole production that outlined a sort of parody of their adventure so far. Yeah. Um, which was pretty hilarious for them. That is but I've awesome. also done festivals where the evil Barakyle wizards have been putting up posters and flyers and putting on a festival in Dagdagiel just in order to create propaganda for themselves, mm. to make themselves look good and to ingratiate themselves upon the local population so that they all think, oh, those Barakyle wizards, they're so nice, they put on festivals and fireworks. Yep. Meanwhile, they're sticking illithid tadpoles in people's brains and manipulating, um, you know, the assembly of princes behind the scenes. It's all a anyway. front. Yep. It's all front. So you can use festivals in different ways. Yeah. Yes, you can. So Avery just pointed out, because uh, while you were uh, off in Never Never Land, um, Avery had mentioned something about New Orleans and that when someone dies, there's sometimes what's called a second line, which is like an impromptu parade, which I didn't know right. about. Yeah, and yeah. then Avery followed up with, they had a second line for David Bowie. It was massive. So that is something to consider in your world is, you know, how, if there's a funeral, how, how well known is this person? Because then that could be a massive event or it could be like crickets and there's only one person, like there's supposed right. to be a big festival, but there's only one right. person here. Uh, yeah, the so king, The king dies and like nobody turns up. Right. Uh -oh. <laughs> so um, I wanted to share in um, a really fun festival and, and the way that we ran it uh, in one of my games there was, uh, I'm trying to think. So there, there was this person who's tied to the character's backstory, his sister, who is one of the like BBEG's minions. They didn't know this at the time. All they knew was we have to try to save his sister. His sister was part of some kind of um, experiments that basically led her to be, um, she would uh, shift in and out of the plane and end up somewhere else like the plane of fire and then she would end up back in the, the material plane and then she would end up over and like she had no control over it and it the only traumatic. way right the only way that she could control it was if she worked for the bbeg because he had a thing that could control her shifting from planes right and so uh at one point while they were dealing with her they were in a tavern and mm -hmm. They were trying to help her, and I rolled to see what happened, and she basically was going to be shifting into the plane of fire. Now, when she did this, there's kind of this, like, rift in space, and the plane of fire just, like, opened up into the tavern, and the tavern basically burnt Ooh. down that night. And Ooh. so the very next day, they were in this town for a while, and so the very next day, now, 
when I say burnt down, it didn't burn like fall down completely flattened, right. like, but it was a husk. Yeah. It was and on so fire. It the very out. next day, the the tavern owner and a few of the local usuals decided to throw not a not a festival. It ended up turning into a festival, but they threw like a yeah. beer drinking uh, and an ale drinking. Uh, competition so party a celebration party. and right. everybody had to pay like 10 gold to participate but what they did was they invited the um, magic initiates Always. from the nearby school and said yeah. uh, we had these folks uh, create a hundred different brews for us brew samples <laughs> and if you pay 10 gold we're gonna have a, a long table here and you can pay your gold and participate in a drinking competition and right. the last one to survive, basically, or to be at the table, wins a part of the pot. And then the rest of the pot goes to the tavern owner so that she can rebuild her tavern. And right. so my players, feeling completely guilty because they were the reason that this tavern <laughs> burnt down, they all participated. And so right. I basically had a wild magic table. So I even I didn't know what the potions were going to do. I basically had them pay the 10 gold. And I said, okay, now everybody drink up and roll a D100. And then I would tell them on this wild magic table what happened to them. And, mm -hmm. I, and I said, do you want to continue or do you want to bow out? And they're like, what do you mean? So like one of them has like, now they're completely blue. The other one has shrunk to like a quarter of their size. The other one has hair all over their body. The other one, you know, is now turned inside out and skins on the inside and bleeding on the outside. And, and I said, do you want to continue? And they're like, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you guys are all still here. Are you continuing? You got to pay another 10 gold and you got to drink another thing. <laughs> and it stacks. So, <laughs> oh, no. so uh, basically they continued and it was the most hilarious, ridiculous session. Um, and it was just this weird impromptu. I didn't even plan on it, but I was like, they just burnt down this person's livelihood. What would the town do? They would do this. Um, right. And so they had a lot of fun. Uh, yes, Johanna, it was wild. I would have to look back in my notes because it's been a while, um, but eventually i think this person ended up going about five rounds uh and one of my players was the last to succeed so they won part of the pot but they ended up giving it all back to the tavern owner anyway they were like that was just too yeah. much fun here you go like <laughs> so but they had to stay that yeah. way. that was the other reason they had to stay that way for 24 hours mm. so so the very next day they had to wait until everything returned back to normal and then they could continue on their journey oddly enough I, I burnt down a tavern last night in in, um, in, in a game called the burning path <laughs> <laughs> of course <laughs> Funnily enough, i might put it make it make it a festival in in, in your honor yeah there you, go. there you go um okay so gosh we still have more to talk about with festivals um mm. let's see oh food we haven't really talked a lot about food yet oh masks or masks, yes. I mean, yeah. if we're talking about costumes and attire and clothing, uh, mm. so I think we mentioned, um, you know, that thing with New Orleans. Right. The 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 uh, I'm the, the, yeah, deer in that, headlights. That yeah. <laughs> anyway, y'all you know what I'm talking about. Talking There's masks involved. Second second lines. Oh, yeah. I wasn't thinking that. I was thinking. Oh, you're um, thinking about like actual um, Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras. Right, yes. Right. Right. But yeah, mm -hmm. there's also like mask balls. You could have right. masks there. Um, yeah. yep. What else? Day of the Dead. Um, mm -hmm. Yep. There's face all painting of even. Not even just masks, face but painting. face painting. Yep. Yep. All those activities, apple bobbing, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. yep. Games. 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 Oh, we haven't even talked. Yeah. Well, that's kind of where right. like my drinking thing was part of a game, right. but right. but yeah, there's all kinds of games that you could right. you, incorporate. All the players come together in in the D and D world, and they play a, a game where they pretend to be industrialized and civilized people from the future, um, who all go to desk jobs and and sit in front of these strange machines with screens on them. The sort of fantasy game that they play <laughs> at this particular festival. Really? That was that was a, that was a joke. Nobody got it. <laughs> no. Uh, well, yeah, and Johanna, Johanna had to leave. 
uh avery oh, no. reminded me of mardi gras and i only just saw it um you know one of those days but okay uh food and feasting i mean that's probably when you think of holidays i don't know about you but that's the number one i think of uh Which the one? number one thing food food, the food yeah, that's right. involved um because right. you sometimes you only get it once a year right you only right. get that food uh like i don't know about you but I, well you guys don't have Thanksgiving, but we don't typically make turkey except right. for Thanksgiving. Uh, right. There's things we that maybe have turkey, have turkey stuff turkey in it, but yeah, you right. don't have turkey at all. <laughs> Not much. I mean, we, we eat a lot of chicken in New Zealand, to be fair, but, yeah. um, you know, everything's on its head over here. So our seasons are upside down, too. Oh, that's um, true. So, yeah. you know, Christmas is summer. So yeah. we're, we have barbecues in the summer um, yeah. and at Christmas. So you'll have a Christmas at the beach. That's know? awesome. And you, you could do that in in your fantasy world. You know, you could choose to to mix up the the seasons in some way. Yeah, um, you could have more or less seasons, um, that kind of thing. You know, one of the interesting things about living in China was the a the amount of fireworks that they set off. Um, especially every time they opened a new building, if there was a building built, they'd set up a set off a whole bunch of fireworks and have a big party. Um, and the other thing, of course, was Lunar Festival, where that is the largest migration of humans on the, in the world that happens every year. Um, you know, like millions of people travel across the whole country. And the country, of course, is huge. And so the rail lines and the airplanes and the roads are just packed for days. Wow. And the, the lines at the train stations, which are, again, huge, um, is insane. You know, so... Yeah, that's an interesting thing. Migrations occur during these festivals. People go go back to their hometown for a certain season, for a certain festival. They're expected to be around their family at that time. Yeah, yeah. So, that's another thing to think about is, it, yeah, the expectations around yeah. a holiday. You know, are you supposed to be with your family? Are you supposed right. to and, not be? You know, are you supposed to be alone? Do you want to be with your family? <laughs> <laughs> we won't no, answer no. that. There's a lot of stress around these things too, you know. People get freaked out. Murders happen. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> you know? Oh my Crime gosh. Crime rates change around holidays, and there's a lot of opportunity at a festival. Yo, oh, yeah, especially for them rogues. Lots of them people rogues. around. Yep. Yeah. Right. All right. Avery's mm -hmm. telling me this thing, and I wrote it down so that I can look this up later. Uh, yep. Said Giddis, you crew. would love the intergalactic crew of Chewbacca. The Cult of the Sacred Drunken Wookiee. This is a science fiction parody parade. I'm a, a parade. Wow. So this is a real parade. I think I like that more than the penis parade in Japan, wow. which I seriously, if I ever go to Japan, I it's on my bucket list to check yeah. out. But now I have to check out this you other thing. You could combine them. I could. What if you combine those, those festivals, you know? Wookiee penises could be a thing. <laughs> oh, my God. Just saying. <laughs> Yes. Just yeah. Oh, I love it. Um, yeah. Okay, so food. Out of Mardi Gras, says Avery. Yeah, food. Uh, I have, I, and I think my, my players enjoy this. Um, there's a few online generator lists that I will have on hand because yeah. I can use uh, monster body parts uh, for, like, fair food. You know, like, they're walking through the city and they'll go, oh, well, so like what kind of food carts are around? And and I think right. at one point I mentioned like there were like a lithid tentacles that were like wrapped around a skewer and barbecued. And that no. I, di I didn't think about no. it very well because my players go, wait a minute, we're in the desert. Where the heck did they get a lithid tentacles? And then I had to immediately come up with like, well, there has to be a way. There has to be a <laughs> way that they hunted this and got this. <laughs> That's the great thing about random tables, isn't it? You you have to explain them somehow, and that's right. that's that can be the funniest thing. Right. We should do a show on random tables. We should. Uh, we're putting I'll it, add it in to the, the list. Yep. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, just having some kind of special food, something different. Um, you know, this is a, a little thing from your book uh, of letting the players describe something. So right. I I have one player who loves to do this to me and it's not a, it's not always a bad thing honestly it's always a great thing but without asking we'll just build something into my world and i go well i guess that's canon now and right. so uh he's he basically he was playing a little girl character who okay. uh, or like a teenage girl like a know-it-all 
and so they're walking through a town and uh this character said well you know i own this candy shop um right. which she did uh i own this candy shop and here you guys got to try this and described what basically sounded like cotton candy that then you magically alight or you light with a magical flame and then the sugar boils down into a lollipop and so basically pulled like a harry potter candy out of his ass and said this is mm. it and i and i said oh my gosh it's canon now and so now in that part of the world there's this really cool cotton candy thing that turns into lollipops and you'll right. get it certain times of the year and so I let my player come up with it. And I think that's a great idea for DMs is like, if you, if you at least show your players that you have this creative side to your festivals, right. then turn it on them and go, okay, you're looking for a food cart. What kind of food cart do you want to find? What kind of food do you want to find? Explain what it looks like, you know, and see what they come up with. Cause they might surprise you. Well, funnily enough, I mean, Avery, he's right here. Um, I I have this NPC in my world called Milmore Glass, who basically is Tom Hardy in a in a gnome, um, and he's he's basically the he's the the quartermaster for the Daughters of Twilight, who are this matriarchal order of clerics and paladins, and so he's the quartermaster, and he he sits there on his table in, in his little room in the archives, and the players come in and and he talks to them a bit like this, and then you know he sort of sounds a bit like Tom Hardy. In any case, if you if you get talking and he doesn't like what you have to say, he'll open his drawer and take out a small package and offer it to you. And inside that package is what is called the everlasting floss. And the everlasting floss, if you put it in your mouth, it basically will lock your mouth up so that you can no longer talk. <laughs> and it will last for perhaps 15 minutes or so. So, you know, it basically he manages to shut you the fuck up if you just can't stop talking. Or if you say something that annoys him, he'll give you everlasting floss. That's um, amazing. And if you don't take it, he'll use command on you to make you do it. So, <laughs> wow, yeah, That's he's a bit awesome. of a wanker like that, but he's fun. So yeah, again, and it was Avery that named it Everlasting Floss. I came up with the candy; he came up with the name. That's perfect. Yeah, yeah so collaboration right there too. You know, yeah. DM and players. Um, the best things come out of collaboration, I think. Anyway. Uh, so mm. let's see what other things to. Th so there's a few things that. I feel like, well, maybe they're not specific to festivals. I, I think originally mm. I thought they were specific to festivals, but now that I'm mm. thinking about it, it doesn't have to be, which is the, we kind of touched on the amount of public participation, right? right. Uh, because uh, certain holidays are not, you know, not all holidays are observed by everyone, but right. I guess the same could be said about festivals as well, right? So, right, you know, cons right. and we talked about like, if this person was a well-known person, everybody would be here. Uh, but if it's just a festival and it's not necessarily about one person, what's right. the expected level of participation? You know, is right, it expected right. that everyone shows up to this? And if you don't, right. do people question it? Do people go, right. where's Sandy? Because Sandy didn't come to the thing. And, right. and your socioeconomic class might have something to do with that or your family line or something. You know, you're expected to turn up to your brother's wedding. And if you, you know, so, but you, but you might not have to turn up to your friend's, friend's, goldfish's, daughter's, sister's, <laughs> brother's Funeral. wedding. Funeral. You know? <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. Um, and the, and yeah. uh, with that, I would think also like the emotional tone and atmosphere. We talked about um, with right. funerals, that could go either way. You could be a really somber thing right. and people are very reverent or it could be awake and people are stomping and drinking and, you right. know, so think about the emotional in, tone of your festival. In New, in New Zealand, the, um, the, the Maori people have uh, traditionally a three-day um, funeral where people turn up and, and people speak for hours at a time, um, you know, and the people are allowed to sleep. And in the Maori culture, while you're sleeping, um, it is acceptable to sleep during speeches because it's believed that you're still taking on board what's being said. So people wake and sleep, and this thing just goes on and on for days and days, you know. Oh, wow. Some people can go over. So, you know, you could incorporate that in some way. Different yeah. cultures may have different festivals on the same day at the same time for the same or even different reasons, too. Oh, yeah. Think about that. Imagine if you had in your party, like, it's today, today's Christmas for one of them, but today is also some other holiday. For, and then it's like, right. well, which one Bonzo do we observe Hanukkah. or do we go to? Like, do you right. split the and, party or? Right. 
can you combine them somehow? How um, yeah. we, 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 in, you've ever been to a like a um, a gay pride parade or anything like that? You know that that, that yeah. sort of thing. You could have you know a halfling pride parade could be fun. Oh, that's uh, a great idea! I love that. You know, something like that. <laughs> what would a halfling easy. pride parade look like? Right. I have to it think about that. Quite small, I expect. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Well, maybe it's huge. Maybe they have the biggest floats of all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, or have, we talked a little, we touched on games, but like having, how, if you incorporate games, is it like all in fun or is it like competitive games? Like, or you know, the Scottish game. games or deadly games. Right. Um, yeah. Because. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, I, go ahead. I had a, so okay, so let's say, say there's this kingdom somewhere where the every every year um, the king summons the greatest champion from around the world, the greatest champions to enter this the death trap dungeon, right? Uh -huh. um, so the, the, you can have a festival around something like this where there's a competition <laughs> or, a, or 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 race? <laughs> oh, a hunt. Uh, well, hunts, yes, I've done the wild hunt, um, uh -huh. but no, I'm thinking uh, jousting. Oh, um, yes, yes, yes. Right, that's a great idea. I mean, jousting is is a very was very much tied up with many festivals. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, that's a, a common thing that you can include. Yes, yes. Yeah. Please talk. I've well, run out of things. No, I was just going to say, if you <laughs> ever come to one of my family's Christmas parties, um, there's jousting? very not jousting, but we get crazy competitive i mean we've actually sent a family member to the hospital just for playing basketball okay in the summer um it's we're it's i i can't even explain it to you it's something you have to experience but we ingrain it into our kids and this is a cultural thing for us but we ingrain it into our kids where uh okay yeah so my husband made me feel weird about this in the very beginning of our relationship until he realized this is just a cultural thing. But with our kids on the holidays, we would say like, okay, we want you to sing a Christmas song and the kids don't want to do it, but we bribe them and we throw money at their feet. And it kind of like, we, we peer pressure them also, but they learn like you're going to sing because it's just expected. But if you sing, yeah. we'll throw money at your feet. And wow. my husband, in the very beginning, my husband's like, it kind of feels like you're like teaching them to be like strippers or something. Like you're just throwing money at them and they have to perform. And I was like, no, it's not like that at all. Like, that's just what we do. And I, I thought about it and I realized like, yeah, I can see how it looks like that. But my experiences as a kid is I remember hating it. But then growing up, I feel like that's what makes me very extroverted is I, I, overcame those hurdles of performance right. or speaking out loud as a right. young kid and right. and having this very good association of money i'm getting right. money to do this thing <laughs> Right, that's right. So, hey, it's what kind of NPCs I was thinking can you throw into a festival too is another thing we haven't really talked about. Yeah. Like yeah. Um, like bards obviously, you know. Bard battles. Mm -hmm. Bard battles, yes. dancers and, and performers, of course, uh, champions and fighters. Mm -hmm. um, somebody's got to do security at these festivals. Yes. You know, and, and all the logistics that are involved. There's, there's all of that stuff. Funding, we talked about that a little bit. Um, can you think of anyone else? Oh, Cooks. Gosh. Yeah, chefs. all the vendors. I mean, all, all the, vendors, the food. Right. The chefs. Right, yeah. Um, yeah. The guests and of honor. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could have a you could have a festival where uh, it could be to a deity, and then the deity turns up. Ooh, I like that yeah. in some Fun. form or another. And then you're wondering, like, right. wait a minute, it's not real. Yeah, <laughs> right. Like, like Fizban and Dragonlance, who's like this doddering old man with a with a funny hat on, and he turns up in various parts of the various Dragonlance stories. But he's actually the god Paladin in his avatar form is this befuddled, confused old wizard <laughs> yeah. who frequently saves the day. Yeah. So, Avery says Halfling Pride had the best food and drink. Yep. Unspeakable floss. Thank you, Avery. Yes. I said an everlasting floss. That I, Yeah, sorry. That's that's right. Unspeakable floss makes so much more sense too. 
Um, so thinking about halfling pride, having a halfling pride parade made me think uh, with gnomes, because gnomes are known to be kind of tinkerers. We have a right. thing around here called Maker Fair. And I don't know if you guys have anything like that, but like, it's just, it's basically like Mythbusters but everyone's doing it and it's it's a big old festival and everybody gets to see wow. what everybody in, what everybody invented. So That's how cool great. would it be to have like a festival like that and now you get to see all kinds of weird, right. you know, machinations and and weird well, automaton creatures and I don't Avery's know. a real life artificer so I'm imagining he would love that. Yeah. Um yeah, I mean you could have magic fairs too like where with illusions and things. Um that, that could be quite fun. I did one recently where there was a festival. I was telling you about the Barrack Isle Envoy did this festival they put on to ingratiate themselves. And they had huge illusions and fireworks, of like dragons and things flying in the sky and um, images from history and stuff, you know, sort of storytelling using illusion magic. Yeah. Um, it can be quite cool. That's actually a great point because you – I have that in my character's backstory where, you know, I'm, I'm a wood elf, but – my woods are up in the tundra so we're very much like a tribal snowy tribal people wow, cool. yeah. and in, in my Love backstory it. we have kind of this festival where like the elders will gather around the fire and in the smoke they weave the smoke into like pictures right. and tell stories and stuff like that's that which fantastic. is kind of what you said so yeah, i love yeah, that right. awesome let's, let's see i'm trying to look at some other festivals to gather some ideas here oh yeah think about okay carnival i've never been but i've seen right. videos of it and the streets are just packed like you can't right. even get through you got to really push your way through if you're going to get somewhere yeah. and uh so think about how congested areas might be you could even make that kind of like a little bit of a skill challenge, even like in the middle of the festival, they're trying to get somewhere, right. but they can't uh, yeah. because. Well, I mean, what about a fight scene that goes from float to float down the middle of a festival? You know, I want to cool. do that now. <laughs> right. And you could have wizards popping out from inside floats, you know, instead of strippers, they could be evil wizards. I don't know. Yes. Something like that or a dragon. You know, oh my gosh. Kind of I love all these ideas. And now I'm already thinking about like a birthday where someone pops out of a right. cake, but it's, I don't know, a gnome artificer or something. Right. <laughs> like, I like the, the idea of like surprise. I mean, a festival makes a, makes a, a, a community quite vulnerable too. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a great time to attack somebody is when they're in the middle of a festival. Mm -hmm. So in using it, how do you how do you create drama from the festival besides the inherent drama of the festival? But for the adventurers who are expecting a little bit of mayhem and death and, and a bit of adventuring, you know, you might want to throw in it's a good time for a heist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, middle of a festival, go and steal some shit from someone because they're all the homes are empty and the guards are busy with the festival. So now's a great time to go breaking into people's houses. See, I was thinking opposite. I was thinking pickpocket because everybody's bumping into each other. You know, well, yeah. Well, it depends what level you are as a rogue, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. you know, the, 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 the thieves guild might have broken them up into teams. Yeah. Uh, you know, also different floats could be produced by different guilds. For example, if you're using guilds, I don't really use guilds much in my games, but if you did, you could have different floats for different guilds and they could all be very competitive and fights could break out. There's after parties where more fights can break out. Mm -hmm. and games yeah you know the other thing i was thinking oh, yeah. of just kind of applying what happens here locally so we have a cherry season where i live and it's actually a big deal there's people who come from all over the state just to drive here to pick cherries and wow. and they'll spend the entire day here and pack a lunch and picnic in the cherry field and then they leave right. with like 20 50 mm. 100 pounds of cherries um Fuck. i mean i live in this town so i don't need to pick that many but <laughs> but uh it's pretty wild and that's it's not even a festival it's just it's just a, a harvest basically right. um but it feels like a festival because the, well, the streets the harvest, harvest festival yeah it's a, yeah it's an actual thing you know yeah. but you the go. streets are congested and like the locals like we oh god going cherry picking like during like the very opening weekend you're like never ever like i'll wait right. <laughs> so what other festivals do we have the music festivals was something i mean i guess that's kind of obvious music festivals food festivals mm -hmm. um 
dancing festivals, a lot of performing arts types of festivals, art festivals. Yes. Um, food, drinks, beer, beer festivals. Um, Carnival and Mardi Gras are the same festival in different parts of the world. Yes. Right. Thank you right. for pointing that out. Right. Um, and ha the Halfling Pride Parade is called the Goliath Pride Parade in other parts of the world. Yes. That's funny. Right. <laughs> Actually, I think I think the, the, the halflings call it the Goliath Parade and everyone <laughs> else calls it the Halfling Parade. <laughs> <laughs> like, hilarious anyway okay folks uh this is about the time where i and i should have said this earlier folks but if you enjoy listening to us kind of hash mm. things out like this and give you mm. ideas and spout all our ideas uh, as they come to us uh now's yep. the time to like and subscribe to our show yep. uh wherever you're finding us we're on facebook it gets posted to youtube and all the podcasting platforms after the fact um my if camera. you have stars to share, oh, Russell, right at the end of the show, who took bets? <laughs> I should have placed a bet. Anyway, uh, if you have stars, uh, we are, uh, we would happily and, and gr be grateful and appreciative if you uh, give us stars on Facebook. Uh, that's where we're live right now. Uh, what else? I want to give, a oh, there's Russell. I want to give a big shout out to our featured band, Ale Storm. Uh, and they're pirates. Show. And they're pirates. Filthy fucking pirates. And yeah. what else was I going to say? Well, See, you. I, I, I want to say. I want to say thank you to to Josh this week. Um, he's our CEO um, at Dungeon Studios because he's been really instrumental into for helping me uh, produce a whole bunch of videos and 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 stuff that I'm now able to do and make look very professional. Um, so thank you, Josh, again. Um, for assisting me with that. It's been fantastic. And now I can spam everyone with tons and tons of marketing <laughs> shit. <laughs> Everybody look out for spam from Russell. <laughs> look out for Russell's spam. Yeah, there's heaps of it and it's coming and there's going to be lots of it. Oh <laughs> my gosh. Okay, sorry. I know I really do have to go, but right. quick thing. So uh, in my real life job, we uh, have a client who, let's just say, uh, does not like us using the word spam uh, in the context that most people use it, because apparently when we say spam, it's like a negative connotation. But spam is apparently great. Most people think most people like spam. I don't know. Is the food spam. Is, the food is spam. Good. Yep. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, anyway, I just thought it was really funny because I remember working with this client. And they were like, no, don't don't say spam. And I was like, right. OK, <laughs> I guess in the marketing marketing context, it's bad, bad because, you know, you block spam and you're right. You've got to go. You've got to go. I do go have on. to go. I'm so sorry. OK, folks. Anyway. Uh, yes. Like and subscribe us where you find us and share with your friends, share with your nerdy friends, your DM friends, your player friends, and we will be back next week and we will be talking about something fun. Something fun, yeah. which we will figure out soon. And yeah. I want to give a big shout out to all our folks in the live chat because you guys just yeah. uh, make our show and we appreciate you, you guys. Yeah. All right, folks, all right, have a good night. See you later. Happy Labor night. Day. Bye.